This morning we're going to be in um, what we typically call the Sermon on the Mount. Pastor Mike uh, spoke to you from this scripture two weeks ago, uh, and uh, we're picking that up again, Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. Let's just bow our heads for a moment before we begin. Father, we ask that you be with us as we come into your word. We live in a culture that has departed from basing itself upon you and your word. And so that puts each and every one of us in a, in a place of tension between what we hear around us and what you say to us as your spirit speaks to us through your word and through your community. So play, I pray that you help us to, to hear your voice clearly today. Uh, whatever our life situation, whatever our past, we know that our future is in your hands as we commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. The seventh of the Ten Commandments reads like this. You shall not commit adultery. Now, I suppose that is probably, if not the most familiar of the, seven, of the Ten Commandments, maybe the second most familiar. You should not kill, you should not commit adultery. If you were to ask anybody who had any passing knowledge of the Ten Commandments, they probably would remember that this one is in there. And adultery, of course, is very much a reality of our sex-besotted and marriage-confused culture. You can't check out the grocery store without seeing the tabloids. And on the tabloids, in some form or another, you will see some reference to adultery. Somebody's changing lanes again. Some starlet or some star is on their fifth or sixth or seventh attempt at perhaps a marriage or something like a marriage. And you'll see the little blurbs about the broken hearts, and you'll see the picture of somebody that's supposed to be happy being very sad, and so on. You go to a school reunion, and you see friends from five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 30 years ago, and uh, every time the, the clan regathers, <laughs> you discover that marriages that you thought would make it aren't making it, and people have found new partners, and somewhere in the midst of that, somebody committed adultery happens down the street. It happens within all of our extended families. Stories of broken vows, new relationships. So on one level, we know all too much about commandment number seven. But do we and our current culture, the world that we live in right now, do we really understand what God meant when he said, do not commit adultery? Jesus comes back to this command and as we're going to see over the next several weeks, he intensifies it from God's point of view, not from the point of view of what it feels like simply as an individual who either wants to get out of a marriage or is abandoned by a partner. Not simply from the point of view of whether it will sell a newspaper or, or make it on Entertainment Tonight. Not simply from the point of view of a society that's wondering what to do with this ancient commandment but from God's point of view. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 says this, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Well, Jesus is referring back to Exodus chapter 20, to God's command, that seventh commandment. And Jesus is anchoring what he's going to say in what God had been saying all along. God's big picture for us, God's commands for us, for the entire human race, for all time, not for just one particular culture. So what's Jesus' goal in single, singling out this particular command? Is he just reiterating an ancient moral code, sort of beating the drum for the old way of doing things? Or is he anchoring this in God's bigger story? Now just to keep us on track here, the word adultery refers specifically to, quote, voluntary sexual intercourse between a married person and a partner other than the lawful spouse. Voluntary sexual intercourse, a sexual relationship between a married person and a partner other than the lawful spouse. Adultery has everything to do with an attack upon a marriage. Now, both parties in an adultery may be married and be cheating on their spouses, or one of the two may be. But this is a specific kind of sexual sin that strikes at the very heart of marriage. And that raises some problems for us in today's culture. We're living in a time in which the word married 
has taken on a totally different set of meanings than it ever had before. Same thing for the word spouse. A marriage can be heterosexual or homosexual. It can be open with multiple partners or monogamous where you are faithful to one partner. A marriage can be understood to be a temporary arrangement right from the get-go. Or it may be intended to be lifelong. A marriage can be just about anything you want it to be. And if a marriage can be anything you want it to be, what's that do with adultery? Does it even exist in people's worlds? Is it even wrong? If marriage can be open and you can have multiple partners, then how could you possibly even talk about adultery as a form of sin that meant having sex with someone other than your spouse? We live in a confused world. So how do we make sense of God's command, you shall not commit adultery? This raises for us a key issue. And I, as I was preparing the message this week, at first I was going to take on more than one verse. And I felt the Lord say to me, just do verse 27. I'm like, that's a little short, Lord. And he goes, it's a little short, except in your society right now, you need to set some basic terms for my perspective. You see, God has a story for those of us who have chosen to follow Jesus. It's a different story than the story that other people in society are following. And we live in a society where we're free to choose what these things mean to us. And we need to respect the fact that others will have different ideas than ourselves. We don't need to go fight with everybody about everything. But most of all, we need to know our story, which is, to the best of our understanding, God's story for us. So how do we make sense out of this term adultery? Well, let me give you an example. And it's an example from sports uh, because that works best for me. Suppose you went to your very first football game not knowing a single thing about the game. You had no idea what they were doing down there. Partway through the game, one of the guys with the black and white striped shirts throws a yellow flag onto the field. And then he announces that a player is being penalized for holding. Now, if you didn't know anything about football, that would sound like the most idiotic penalty in the world. After all, that's all the guys do to each other. Every time somebody gets the ball, 20 other, 11 other people try to hold him. That is, pick him up, turn him upside down, and drive him into the ground, fall on him, but they're holding on to him. They hold on to the ball. I mean, all kinds of things are going on. So the word holding would mean nothing to you and the 10-yard penalty that would come with it would seem like a ludicrous, arbitrary, ridiculous, unfair thing to do to your team. I mean, after all, isn't the game all about grabbing somebody? But if you understand the game, the big picture of the game, the penalty begins to make sense. After all, imagine a football game in which the moment the ball was snapped, everybody grabbed everybody. Nothing would happen. It would look like a weird square dance or something. <laughs> First thing you do, grab somebody, knock them down. <laughs> Everybody's on the ground, no play. And the whole point of not allowing people to just arbitrarily grab the guy in front of them is to let the play happen. Now, people try to sneak a hold and get away with it part of the time, but more often than not, you see the jersey getting stretched or you see some player go flop to the ground and out comes the flag so that the game can be played the way it was meant to be played. Now if you don't understand the whole point of the game of balancing what the offense can do with what the defense can do making it fair if you will for both sides so that people can score points but not too many so that people can stop plays but not every time and you get that perfect balance or the best you can do then the penalty makes sense. Same thing is true with God's law. Take a commandment out of context, and you have no idea what it's all about. God's commandment against committing adultery requires that we understand the game in which the penalty happens to be so important. And the game, if you will, is God's overall plan for us, his story what I, that I would call his gift of marriage to us. Marriage is the game, adultery is the foul. So in order to understand what God's saying to us, we need to step back 
And this is going to be very important for us to do in a confused culture like ours. And say, okay, we see marriage in various forms, and it seems to be re being redefined just about every, every month. We're sitting here waiting for the Supreme Court at some point to tell us one way or the other whether marriage as we've known it for thousands of years will ever exist again. We live in that confusion. What does God have to say about it? God's gift of marriage, marriage as He defines it, is not based upon what's going on in our culture or any other culture, but is based upon the story of why God created us in the first place. The creation story way back in the book of Genesis tells us that when God set about to create humans, he created them, quote, in his image. And from that story, we learn three things, at least, that are crucial to understanding God's gift of marriage and God's definition of marriage. The first thing we learn is that God created humans to reflect his image in stereo. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, we read, at the end of the creation story, the sixth day of creation, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. To be made in God's image means that God made humans to be his representatives on earth. Back in ancient times, the king was typically thought to be made in God's image. That is to say that the invisible God of, the, of a given people chose a person and somehow inspired that person to be his representative on earth. The Pharaoh was considered to be the God in physical form on earth, or the son of the God, the sun God. And so they, would, they could say, and did say, that the king, like the pharaoh, for instance, was the image of God, sort of like a statue in a temple would be an image of the unseen God. What stands out in the biblical story, in God's story in the Bible, is that it's not the king that is created in the image of God alone. It's not just males that are created in the image of God alone. But as Gordon Wenham puts it, it appears that the Old Testament has democratized this old idea. It affirms that not just a king, but every man and woman bears God's image and is his representative on earth. What an amazing thing for an ancient people. God revealed to them. It's not just about one gender or the other. It's not just about one powerful person who lords it over everyone else. Every human is made in my image. And that means that we have to have both the male and the female clearly understood as such, functioning together to fully create the full picture of God's reflection in this world. That's the first thing we see, is that, uh, that God reflects his image in stereo. The second thing that flows out of that is that a key part of our human assignment is to bring forth the next generation of image bearers. God said, I'm not going to just create Adams and Eves every single generation. I'm going to delegate that to the male and the female, to the men, men, men and the women that I've created. Genesis chapter 1, the beginning of verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, first commandment in the Bible, be fruitful and increase in number. Now, the only way that that can happen is through an egg and a sperm through the male and the female coming together in some way. We've created a lot of interesting technologies to try to help that process along, but they still require genetic material from a male and a female. And of course, the vast majority of the human race comes together according to God's story. A husband and a wife, a man and a woman come together. And one of the ways that they reflect God into his world is by creating the next generation, fulfilling that command. What a blessing that we get to bring a new life. We call that procreation, not to confuse it with God creating out of nothing, but it's a creative process. And I would add, not only do we bring children, but we nurture them and raise them. Those of you who have adopted children 
are stepping into the gap and doing just that same thing. You're reflecting God's presence, uh, particularly when, you, when there can be a, a dad and a mom in a home or a stepdad and a mom or a stepmom and a dad, adoptive parents, those of us who are uh, in the grandparent role, those of us who are as aunts and uncles or mentors to children are in a surrogate role where, again, we reflect God's fullness most completely by nurturing that next generation in stereo, the male and the female there. Now, the last thing I want you to see, so we have image in stereo, and we have this whole idea of bringing forth the next generation. The last thing I want you to see that is part of God's gift of marriage is that he wants to rule his world through us. Let me read the end of verse 28 for you. Genesis 1, 28. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Now, ruling over the animals does not mean exploiting them or driving them to extinction. I'm not talking about exploiting and taking all that you can get out of nature until there is nothing left. He's talking about, God is talking about us bringing God's good and loving order into the world so that it becomes a good place for all of his creation. The story of Noah is a story of conservation, if you will, where Noah is instructed to very carefully gather up the living creatures that could not fend for themselves. And this same idea of bringing God's good order to the world applies to our families. Every marriage, every family is a little kingdom, if you will, in which God's image bearers establish God's presence, God's loving order, God's rule, a safe place, a place where right can be right and wrong can be clearly defined as wrong, a place where children learn fairness and where they learn forgiveness and where they learn uh, how to be image bearers of God. Children do not come into the world as perfect images of their creator. Isn't it funny how nobody has to teach a child to be selfish? Have you figured that one out yet? Nobody has to give your child a crash course in stretching the truth. Today we're going to teach you how to lie. This is how you do that. No, we find that we are working against that disorder and that moral corruption all the time. And every day you probably find a teaching moment. Kid comes home from school and tries a new word out on you. And after you recover your the color in your face and so on. Well, where did you learn that, honey? <laughs> and then you have a little teaching time because the child doesn't know any better. I remember when I was in France learning French and a lady that would teach me, she lived in a little yellow sort of kiosk and sold newspapers. She was a Belgian lady. She spoke French, of course. And uh, so every... Uh, I was a babe in the woods. I mean, I'm learning this language from scratch and... Once in a while, she would teach me a word. Sounded like all the other French words to me. And I'd try it out at church. <laughs> Once. <laughs> I remember the pastor, a young guy about my age, and I said something, and he's like, we don't say that. Like, Thank you. That's our job, is to bring God's rule and God's order. Not some harsh authoritarian, this is the way it has to be, but God's order. We help our kids organize their worlds. Things like, did you get your homework done? And maybe helping them with it. Things like having an allowance. Where's Steve, huh? Beginning of financial peace, right? Teach a kid how to use their money. I think, that, I think you mentioned how important for the next generation. Teaching your kid to drive. How many enjoyed doing that? <laughs> but how important is that? Uh, showing your kids how to drive. Did you know they were watching you for 14 years before you put them behind the wheel? Thank you very much. I mean, one of my grandkids ought to have the little funny hat, you know, because, I mean, he knows when you're one mile, Grammy, Grandpa, you're over the speed limit. It's like, it was only one mile, but, you know, to him, that's a bit, and it is. There you go. See. God's order. So here is God's picture of what we're to do, and Ephesians 6 puts it so beautifully, 6-4. Fathers, 
Do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. That's what I'm talking about when I say that God calls us to let our marriage be a place where His rule and His order create a safe and a loving garden, if you will, for these tender little plants to grow. So it's deep into the fourth quarter. Only seconds are left on the clock. Your team has mounted a heroic goal goal line stand. They've got their backs to the goal line. If they can get through one more play, it's fourth down and two yards to go. If they can get through one more play, they win. But if the other team can get the ball into the end zone, no time left on the clock, your team loses, the other team wins. The center of the opposing team snaps the ball to the quarterback who sets up to pass. A defender, one of your guys, breaks through the line and is about ready to sack the quarterback and that'll end the game. When one of the offensive linemen steps into the gap, picks up the defender with a great big bear hug, wrestles him to the ground, ball gets thrown, touchdown. Or is it? Well, if you know the game of football, you know that everybody in the stadium, as well as everybody watching television, is looking for one thing. Will there be a flag? Now, if there is a flag, then there's going to be a penalty, and there won't be a touchdown, and that the ball will get backed up, and we'll do this whole thing one more time. If there isn't a flag, there's a touchdown, the other team wins, clock runs out, one team goes away happy, one team goes away sad. If you love the game of football, and you saw a penalty committed, an overt, flagrant example of holding, where this player who had a chance to end the game is knocked to the ground and not given a chance to make his play. If you love the game of football, you're going to want to see the flag, even if it hurts your team. Because sure enough, there's going to be another game when you're going to need that flag because the foul was committed against you. God's command that we never commit adultery is a command that we need if we're going to love and fulfill the story of marriage to the degree that God makes that possible for us in our lives. Remember those three things I just talked to you about that are so crucial to God's gift of marriage that we reflect his image in stereo, that we bring forth another generation, nurture those, that next generation in stereo, that we create his order rather than the chaos of the world around us. Well, you see, the sin of adultery destroys each of those three things. When we commit adultery, we break a promise we made to our spouse. We are unfaithful. We are untrue. We are selfish. However it feels, however justified it may be, however wild the hormones may be that race through us, nonetheless, we've broken our word. And that is the opposite of the reflection of God. If God wanted to go on his feelings, he probably would have had some negative feelings toward you and me based on what we've done with our lives. But what would he do? He said, no, I'm going to be faithful to you. I told you that I love you. I told you that I had a plan for you. I'll even give of my best to bring you back. So when we commit a sin like adultery, we fail to reflect God. And isn't that true in so many ways? Uh, When a relationship becomes inflamed and becomes unhappy and both sides are sniping at each other, God's not being reflected anymore. Pastor Mike and Pastor Gus, Pastor Kerry and I work with not only my generation, but with a younger generation that is very conflicted about the very idea of marriage. Why? because they haven't seen it work. They haven't seen and felt God's reflection to where they could say, I gotta have that. Instead, they sort of come in so many cases very tentatively and say, I don't know if it'll work for me. And we, we all pray with them and, and work with them for the healing to come where they would be able to take on that assignment. So adultery destroys the reflection of God. Secondly, Adultery strikes right at the heart of how God meant for men and women to come together in this most sacred way. It's a sin that goes right to the deepest, most intimate, most sacred aspect of a marriage itself. 
Anybody who's been through this and has suffered from a partner who cheated knows that the sense of violation is, is just brutal. Satan is very, very clever, isn't he? If he wants to destroy God's plan, he's going to go right to the place where it will do the most damage. Thirdly, adultery creates disorder. Oh, it may feel like it's the thing to do and it's the great escape from, from some painful situation that doesn't seem to want to work out and so on and so forth. And it may seem like it's the beginning of a whole new life, but look at what happens to the former life. Look at what happens to the kids. Look what happens to the reputation. Book of Proverbs uh, minces no words. Proverbs chapter 6, I want to read you verses 28, 29, and then 32 to 35. Can you walk barefoot on hot coals and not get blisters? It's the same when you have sex with your neighbor's wife. Touch her and you'll pay for it, no excuses. Adultery is a brainless act. Soul-destroying, self-destructive. Expect a bloody nose, a black eye, and a reputation ruined for good. For jealousy detonates rage in a cheated husband. Wild for revenge, he won't make allowances. Nothing you say or pay will make it all right. Neither bribes nor reason will satisfy him. Now Paul, writing to a church many years later that was made up of mostly pagans reminded them that sexual sins including adultery disqualified them from God's kingdom but then he says a wonderful thing and this is what we need to take home with us today as we have these powerful warnings against having the penalty flag of adultery thrown uh, into our married life or into the life of someone else if we're not married and are tempted to interfere in that marriage. He says a wonderful thing in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. He's listed off a whole list of destructive behaviors. And then he says this, and that is what some of you, what's the next word? That's what some of you were. Wow. But you were washed. You were sanctified, made holy. You were justified, declared innocent in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's what some of you were. And that's the good news of God's story. It's not just a story about how things ought to be. And then when we fail, we're out for good. But instead, it's a story of how things are in God's reality. And he opens the door and he says, all may come and be part of this story. Oh, yeah, but you know what I did? I've, I've done this and that and that. It doesn't matter. That's what you were. This is who you are now. Jesus came and died for our sins so that we could be forgiven for those failures and sins. That's what happened for the followers of Jesus in Corinth. If you ever study the, the story of the city of Corinth, it was a story awash in pornography. It was a story awash in prostitution. It was a sailor's town. It was a San Francisco of the ancient world. It was a city that was known for a place where what that happens in Corinth stays in Corinth, if you will. Many of these people had been swept up in all of that sin, probably never thought they were doing anything that wrong until they came to Jesus. So these weren't just lily-white religious people who were part of some super spiritual cult. No, these were people who had partied hard and had all kinds of sexual sin in their lives. And Paul says, that's what you were, but God took care of it. God has made you clean so that this gift of his being his image, in his image, can be your reality. And the same is true for you and me. Whatever our past, Jesus calls us into his future. Isn't that the choice we make? Do I want my past and all of its consequences or his future? He promises to wash us clean, to make us holy, and to give us full status in his family with no asterisk next to our name. Not only that, but he also promises to give us the power to forgive those who sinned against us and our families. It's his goal that we bear his image, males and females, in a way that is pure and clear, especially when it comes to our sexuality. And that's why he gave us this good gift of marriage. 
In just a moment, we're going to take a moment to pray, and I will ask our prayer team at, when we stand in just a moment to come down. Uh, some of us have failed in this area. As we're going to see next week, most of us have failed, at least mentally, in this area. Maybe very deliberately, uh, maybe just been tempted in very powerful ways. Some of us have been horribly harmed and injured by someone else's failure. The loss of a, of, a, of a mate or children that feel abandoned by a parent who went with another, uh, another um, partner and so on. And some of us are not even sure what we think about this whole business of sexual sin or adultery or marriage or whatever because the world is so confused about it now. Everybody's just kind of figuring it out for themselves. Wherever you're at, I just want to call you back, not to what I think, because it doesn't matter what any one of us thinks, but to God's story as we understand it to be presented to us in his word. This becomes something that you need to kind of parse through and work on. I'd be glad to talk with you and pray with you. I know Pastor Gus would do the same. Pastor Mike, Pastor Kerry, we would love to, to just kind of hear your story and, and pray with you because the application of God's story in our lives is different for each and every one of us. But this is God's story. This is the big game. And of course, penalties happen in games. But the important thing is that we pick that flag up and go forward. And that's what Jesus offers to do for you and me. Can we bow our heads together? Worship team, if you would come. I uh, ask that, um, that you come and stand here. Would you please stand, everybody, with me? And Father, I just want to pray a prayer of your blessing out over our society here, our little Christian group that we are, followers of Jesus that you would turn the lights on to see what it means to be human as you have revealed that to us. Lord, I ask that we could see that not in a way that causes us to be haughty and unpleasant to others, but so that we could be clear and truly understand the magnitude of the wonderful assignment that you've given to us and the fact that it can only be fulfilled if we do it according to the Creator's instructions. I pray a blessing upon every marriage of every person here in this room, those that hear this, uh, see this sermon online or on cable. We need your help. We need your help, Lord. We are both males and females, imperfect agents of you. I especially pray for your forgiveness and your cleansing and restoration for anyone who has struggled in this area and can't seem to get free, can't seem to feel that forgiveness that comes from you. Lord, break through any place of shame or guilt. We thank you that every one of us qualify for that phrase. That's what some of you were, but now we're washed, we're made holy, we're given full status in your family. Lord, help us as we go forward into this summer we will come out of this time better reflectors of who you are in Jesus' name.